Good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament's first ever party leaders virtual question time. This is an unusual format for us, but these are unusual and uncertain times. Joining me today are the First Minister from St Andrew's House in Edinburgh and from around the country, the leaders of our political parties. The leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Jackson Carlow, of Scottish Labour, Richard Leonard, the co-leader of the Scottish Greens, Patrick Harvey, and the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Willie Rennie. Now, before we turn to our first question, I'm going to ask the First Minister if she can bring us a brief statement updating us on COVID-19 and the government's response. First Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the other party leaders. It's now exactly 100 days since the first cases of coronavirus were reported in Wuhan, and in that time, our lives have been transformed in ways that would have been unimaginable just a few weeks ago. And this virtual session of FMQs might, in the scheme of things, be a relatively minor example of that, but it is a striking example for our Parliament. So I want to place on record my thanks to you, Presiding Officer, and all the Parliament staff for making this happen. Uh, I do want to give a very brief update on the latest figures we have in relation to COVID-19 in Scotland. As at uh, nine o'clock uh, this morning, there have been 4,957 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 392 from the figures reported yesterday. As always, I should be clear that these figures will be an underestimate. A total of 1,781 patients are currently in hospitals across the country with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is an increase of 10 on the number reported yesterday. And a total of 212 people at last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected cases of the virus. That is an increase of two from yesterday. And it is with great sadness that I must report uh, an additional uh, 81 deaths of patients who had tested positive for COVID-19. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland where the individual had tested positive to 447. However, as you're aware, National Records of Scotland are now publishing weekly figures which will report on deaths where the virus is presumed as well as confirmed. And I want to convey my deepest sympathy to all those who've lost loved ones to the virus and also say a heartfelt thank you to everyone working so hard to keep essential services running at this time of crisis. That, of course, includes our health and care staff, and I expect that all of us uh, and thousands across the country will express their appreciation for them again tonight at 8pm with applause. Uh, I know that opposition leaders will have questions on a range of matters uh, on health and care services and on the wider economic and social impacts of COVID. But since we're about to enter the Easter weekend, I want to conclude with a strong re-emphasis of the vital importance of everyone following the public health restrictions that are in place and staying at home except for the permitted essential purposes. I know how hard it is for people to do that. It will seem even harder over this Easter holiday weekend, especially for families with children, indeed for the children themselves, and for older people who would normally be spending time with their grandchildren. Uh, so please uh, stay in touch with family, friends and loved ones in whatever alternative way best works for you. Reach out to and look out for people even as you stay physically apart from them. But please do follow the rules and stay at home over Easter. By doing that, all of us can help to slow down the spread of this virus. We can help to protect our National Health Service and we can also help to save lives. So I'll end by thanking everybody in advance for doing the right thing over this weekend. Thank you very much, First Minister. We're going to turn now to questions. Question number one from Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Presiding Officer, can I begin by expressing the heartfelt sympathies of all Scottish Conservatives for all those who've endured uh, lost many families over the course of the last week. And I also thank the uh, First Minister and politicians from all across Scotland for their good wishes to the Prime Minister uh, as he recovers from the virus himself. Boris, if you're watching, we're all urging you to get well soon and back into number 10. Um, Presiding Officer, can I also applaud the virtual first that we're doing today and begin by asking the First Minister about personal protection equipment or PPE as it's commonly called. Now, unions are saying the PPE guidelines are confusing. Frontline staff say the equipment isn't robust enough. Care homes say they don't get the kit until after the virus has actually 
entered a care home. And it emerged that the new PPE distribution hubs that the Scottish Government have set up may be shut at Easter. Now, for several weeks, we've been told that the supplies are adequate, that the problem is with distribution. And we all know this because we're all getting emails and calls from frontline staff and care homes. They've been told they've got the equipment, but obviously they're phoning us to tell us that's not the case. So, first of all, at what point will you be able to say with absolute confidence that an effective distribution uh, is in place for PPE? And if necessary, will you use logistics experts? I mean, many of them are currently doing nothing uh, from the private sector or even our armed forces if it becomes necessary, as they've helped elsewhere. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I should say just uh, at the start, we have uh, army logistics support based in this building in St Andrew's House already helping us with many of these issues. And I'm deeply grateful to them for that. So we will draw on support logistics and otherwise uh, when we need it, uh, wherever we need it from. The issue of PPE is of fundamental paramount importance and we have uh, been working hard to resolve the concerns that people have that roughly fall into the following categories. It's adequacy of supplies, distribution of those supplies to where they are needed, the guidance we're issuing to workers about what types of equipment they should be using in what circumstances and, and also there have been concerns raised about the quality. So, so very briefly, we do have adequate supplies. We're not complacent about that. There are global uh, pressures on that supply. We have taken significant steps to improve uh, distribution and we continue to do that, addressing glitches or concerns where they arise. And uh, we uh, commented yesterday at the briefing uh, Jean Freeman and I did about uh, working to make sure that distribution uh, centres are open over the Easter weekend, just as GP practices and pharmacists uh, will be. On the guidance, you may uh, not have an opportunity yet to see the joint statement that has issued this morning between the Scottish Government, COSLA and trade unions. Uh, we all took part in a meeting that was convened by the Deputy First Minister and the Health Secretary yesterday. Uh, that statement endorses the Four Nations guidance as being uh, good uh, quality guidance, but it also makes clear that uh, wherever a health or care worker on the front line feels that they should be wearing a mask, uh, they should do so. It is their professional judgment uh, that should be the, the guiding factor. And the Scottish Government will continue to work hard to make sure adequate supplies uh, get to the front line. On the issues of quality, there was a letter yesterday from medics. The chief medical officer is engaging with the signatories of that letter. When the guidance uh, that was issued last week was drawn up. Uh, there was input from experts from uh, royal colleges uh, and uh, there has also been health and safety uh, executive uh, input into the quality of uh, PPE that is being provided. So, you know, we treat these issues as hugely important and on an ongoing basis we will continue to address any concerns that arise. There is of course an email address that anybody on the front line, in the front line workforce can use if they have concerns that they want to be immediately brought to the attention of me and ministers. Jackson Carlo. Yeah well I mean of course I accept that um, you will be taking these issues incredibly seriously and I'm pleased that you know that engagement is taking place. I'm pleased about the issues of quality. I'm pleased that centres will be open uh, for the Easter weekend but obviously what I am concerned about is this ongoing issue with distribution because so many uh, people are still contacting directly to say they don't have it and I'm not sure I did hear when you felt you would be confident that there would be a permanently successful distribution strategy in place. But I'd also just like, I mean, you'll come back to that, I know, but I'd like to raise the issue of shielding of vulnerable people. Because yesterday, Sainsbury said they were still waiting for a list of those who are vulnerable. And we were told last night by a council that they still don't know when food boxes will be delivered. Now, I accept that online delivery is not the only way to help vulnerable people. There are many who can't, though, get a slot for several weeks ahead where online delivery is available. And again, in Scotland, it seems that this has been rumbling on for weeks, whereas it is being resolved elsewhere. And I know people are getting frustrated, incredibly frustrated in my own constituency and people who are emailing me from elsewhere in Scotland. So I can ask, when will it be fixed? When will supermarkets have the names of those who actually need to be supported and prioritised? 
Well, question. let me come to that question in detail in a moment, but before I do, let me just uh, briefly round off on the issue of PPE. Um, you, you asked me when can I be confident. We, we have improved the distribution. We continue to improve the distribution. I think we do now have an effective distribution system in place. Um, I'm not going to though, predict that there will never be any glitches or there will never be problems that arise with that, such as the scale and magnitude of what we're trying uh, to achieve here. So we will continue to have an approach where we quickly and I hope effectively resolve any issues in distribution uh, that arise. But I do believe those systems are in place and in the main are working effectively. But we want to hear on an ongoing basis if anybody on the front line feels that they're not getting what they need. I've said before, and this will apply to all of us here, not just to me. Um, I'm overseeing this uh, coronavirus response as First Minister, but I've got family on the front line of the NHS. We all want these workers to have the protection that they deserve, and that's something I take hugely seriously seriously. Um, on shielding, let me just give a bit of a, an update. The, the shielded group, as we call them, um, are within certain medical groups that were carefully considered uh, by medical uh, professionals and experts. Uh, we originally said up to 200,000 people in Scotland would be in that group, but we thought that would then be closer to 120,000. Uh, the figure that uh, is the final one is 136,000. Uh, that's uh, after some further discussions with doctors. They have all now had letters and they have been given a text message service uh, to register with if they need help getting food or medicines. I can tell you uh, as of now 21,000 of them have registered with that uh, service. Uh, just under 6,000 food packages have been ordered and we have a national contract with two supermarkets in place for the delivery of those food boxes free of charge um, I should say and uh, 4,700 uh, sorry 4,200 I think that is have already been been delivered so that process is underway. We're also working with supermarkets uh, for people who want to get their deliveries uh, via supermarkets of their own choice. And a text will go out to people who've registered from the service, uh, I hope later today, asking them if they want their details passed to supermarkets. There will then be a priority service delivered by the supermarkets, which we expect to be up and running in the early part of next week. So we've taken some time to make sure this is a, a system and a service that is reliable and robust. Uh, but I would stress that people do not have to rely on normal supermarket slots because the national contract that is in place with uh, breaks and bid food uh, will mean that people get these food boxes delivered free of charge if they register for that service and ask for that service to be delivered to them. Jackson Carlo. Okay, I'm conscious of time, presiding officer, so I'll move swiftly on. But that was uh, some very helpful information in there, First Minister, and I just hope that all of that can be put in place quickly. Um, when grants were announced for business um, to get through these tough times, Fiona Hislop, your Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, told the Scottish Parliament March the 18th that they would be per property. And businesses were assured that every penny of support funding would be passed on, and, you know, they planned on that basis. But it then emerged that in Scotland alone, grants would only be on the basis of one per business, not one per business outlet. And that puts any firm in Scotland with more than one outlet at a huge disadvantage compared to those in England and Wales. First Minister, businesses in our high streets are dealing with the reality and not the theory of this crisis. And they're saying to us, they need this support if they're going to be there at the end of this crisis. They're asking me to ask you as First Minister to think again. Will the First Minister do so? Um, we are thinking carefully about the support we give to businesses. So every single penny of the consequential funding coming from the UK government is being passed on to businesses. Uh, we have designed this support in a way that allows more businesses to benefit. So uh, by uh, limiting the grants to one per business, we have enabled more businesses uh, to benefit. So there are some uh, properties, for example, with rateable values uh, between 15 and 18,000 who get a grant in Scotland who would not get that grant if they were in England. Uh, we've also given a range and providing a range of support that's available in Scotland, but not elsewhere. So we're providing help for businesses uh, who have difficulties with uh, water charges. We've uh, provided a financial support package for the bus industry. We've provided five million pounds for the seafood uh, sector. Um, uh, another £10 million pounds for seafood billion uh, business resilience. We've provided funding through Creative Scotland for artists and those in the creative sector. Um, we are providing uh, money for a range of uh, sectors that is support not available elsewhere. So every penny has been passed on, but we're trying to do that in as fair a way as possible. 
in, in a way that captures and provides assistance to as many businesses as possible. But I'm acutely aware, and this will be true in the UK as in Scotland, that there will be further support that businesses require in the period to come. So we continue to talk to business organisations, individual sectors and businesses about what more we can do to support them, and that conversation will continue. Jackson Carlo. Well, it's just that the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy told them that they could expect to receive parallel funding to that that was going to be available in England and Wales. Many of them spoke to their banks on that basis. And the danger if you've got two or three small outlets and you're only going to get support for one of them is that the other two may no longer be open and that could be a loss of jobs and viable businesses going forward. But finally, really just on the issue of um, the end of this crisis, uh, I mean, everybody wants to know when it will end. We realise that the key thing is to flatten the curve, to reduce acute pressure on the NHS. And we know that for the moment, as you said in your statement, it's vital that all of us stay at home, all of us, uh, protect the NHS and save lives. But people do want to look to the future as much as any of them can. And today's newspapers are full of reports that we might understandably living under the lockdown for some weeks yet. So, Presiding Officer, I can ask the First Minister to confirm that while this is first and foremost a public health decision, it is one that will be taken in lockstep as part of a four-nation strategy across the UK and that we can all hope as a country to come out of this together eventually. First Minister. Um, I certainly hope the UK will be able to come out of these lockdown measures in an orderly way that protects health uh, and is mindful of the other impacts um, in a, a unified way. Although we do, across the uh, different parts of the UK, have to be mindful of the spread of the virus in uh, the different nations and regions. I had a call this morning uh, with the other First Ministers and the Mayor of London where we were uh, discussing our different experiences and there's a, a meeting of COBRA later today. Uh, let me be very clear, I, I don't want these measures to be in place for a, a single minute longer than they have to be. Uh, but equally, I don't want us to come out of them prematurely uh, in a way that will do damage, that we see the virus spiral out of control, see our NHS potentially overwhelmed and see more lives lost. So it's right and proper that we stick with it for as long as necessary. And I want to be clear to people, because there's a lot of media speculation, there is no likelihood or prospect of these measures being lifted after the Easter weekend. Uh, Cobra is likely to meet again uh, I think uh, later next week, I would certainly support that to start to think about the, the exit strategy, what that might look like. But it is likely that restrictions and measures are going to be in place for some weeks to come yet. And again, I would appeal to people to stick with this. We are not asking people to change their lives in such a fundamental way for no reason. I don't want to be doing it, but it is vital for the health reasons I think we all understand. Uh, thank you, uh, colleagues. Now, I don't have my gavel to hand. It's difficult to make eye contact, but I would just ask you all to be conscious of the time. I'm going to try and finish this whole session by one o'clock. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and can I begin by offering the condolences of the Scottish Labour Party to all of those families who have lost loved ones uh, over the course of the last few weeks, not least to the families of... Uh, of Catherine Sweeney and Janice Graham, two frontline uh, workers in Scotland who have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the last few days. Uh, and we applaud the efforts of all of those uh, frontline workers who are in the end uh, saving lives and, and at times putting their own lives at risk uh, in so doing. It's a national collective effort, but they are very much leading it. Which is all the more reason why I, I do want to return to the issue that has arisen over the last few days around the guidance issued by the chief nursing officer on personal protective uh, equipment, which has caused a, a good deal of concern amongst people working on the front line, people who are already working in the community, providing home care or district nursing services, for example, already under pressure, put under even more stress and pressure. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is to the First Minister, can she give a categorical reassurance that those workers in the community on the front line will receive the personal protective equipment, the right and adequate personal protective equipment that they need? First, the issue Richard Leonard raises is an important one. It's, the, the issue that was raised about the guidance is not so much about the supply of PPE, which we continue to work hard to maintain and distribute, although, as I said earlier on, there are pressures globally around these supplies, so there's no complacency there. This was a, an issue about 
the, the guidance and the interpretation of that guidance. In short, the Chief Nursing Officer's letter uh, said, and it was intended to simply interpret and articulate the UK wide guidance, uh, that uh, workers, care workers, should not feel the need to wear a mask unless they for somebody who wasn't confirmed or suspected with the virus, unless they risk assess that they should. Uh, what we've done in the joint statement that I referred to earlier, which would, I would encourage everybody to read, it's been uh, agreed with COSLA and the trade unions, is, is flip that on its head um, and say that uh, every care worker should feel that they can wear a mask unless in their professional judgment they don't need to. So it is a much more precautionary uh, based statement and I hope builds uh, confidence with care workers uh, who are in the front line doing incredibly difficult jobs. Now that uh, statement which endorses the guidance uh, but is very clear about that interpretation of it has been agreed as I say with the Scottish Government, with COSLA and with the unions who all took part in a meeting yesterday. So I hope that resolves that issue and of course we continue to focus on supply and distribution. Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. The other question I want to touch on is the question of testing. The World Health Organization continue to advise test, test, test. And the National Clinical Director told the BBC this morning in an interview that I think 5,000 uh, health and care workers have been tested in Scotland. So my question to the First Minister is, um, how many health and care workers have requested uh, to be tested? A breakdown between uh, those 5,000 people, how many are uh, care workers and how many are NHS workers? And what are the current rates of absenteeism in the National Health Service and in our care services? Uh, the current rate in the National Health Service uh, related to the virus has been around 6% and we continue to, to monitor that carefully. Uh, we are increasing the numbers of healthcare staff and where appropriate their family members close contacts uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. The 5,000 figure we've given we hope to update in the next couple of days and I would expect it to be obviously uh, higher than that. We are building testing capacity with every day that passes right now and uh, by the end of this month we'll have the capacity to do three and a half thousand tests per day. It's over 2,000 right now and it will go higher than that and that's simply within the NHS. We're also seeing to bring uh, on uh, stream academic and commercial testing capacity as well. Um, testing is really important. It's important now. It will become uh, really important as we have an exit strategy as a, a way of going back to a contained phase of this virus where you, you test and isolate uh, and trace contacts. But I, I want to be very clear right now about the limitation of testing. The current diagnostic test we're using can tell whether somebody has the virus it, while they're symptomatic and that's important but what it doesn't do is tell somebody who is in the incubation period uh, that they have the virus nor does it tell people once they've recovered that they've had the virus so there's quite narrow windows in which this test allows us to, to say whether a health worker or uh, somebody else would be fit to return to work because they test negative one day uh, they may be in the incubation period they may be positive, or we may show up positive uh, the next day. So it's an important tool and we will use it to the maximum capacity. Uh, but we've also got to understand uh, the, the limitations of it and therefore the importance of seeing hopefully in the future what's called the antibody testing, which will allow us to tell whether somebody has had the virus, assuming of course that it does confer an element of immunity. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. The First Minister uh, spoke about um, maximum testing, which I think is important, but I also want to raise the question of compassionate testing. And I want to ask the First Minister today if she will commit to look at the case for testing uh, those people who have lost somebody uh, through COVID-19 so that they are not grieving alone. Would she also consider the case of people who are receiving end of life treatment in our hospices or hospitals uh, who frankly do not want to die alone. Will you be prepared to agree to the testing of immediate family members of people in that situation? In the end, we talk a lot in this discussion about statistics, but it is about human beings. Uh, and I would ask the First Minister to look uh, favourably at those compassionate grounds for extending testing. First Minister. Of course, I, I will look at that and I, I will look at that uh, very uh, carefully. Um, I would say two things because I, I don't uh, 
challenge the, the premise of the question about the, the importance of compassion in every aspect of our response uh, to this. The first point I would make is simply that we need to make sure we are using our testing capacity in the, the, the best strategic way possible to help us beat the virus and, and have the best chance of doing that. The second point I would make, uh, not to negate the fact I will look at the, the issue carefully, is that there is only an effectiveness in testing somebody when they are symptomatic. Um, there is no point testing somebody before they are displaying symptoms and there is no point testing people after they have displayed symptoms. So I, I come back to that relatively narrow uh, window of opportunity just to illustrate the point that while there may, might be many people who want to be tested to show that they don't have or, or perhaps have had it, the current test is not uh, capable of doing all of that. So we continue to use it where we think it is most appropriate and is helping us with the wider efforts against the virus. But of course, I will always look at suggestions that are made um, and happy to come back on that once there's an opportunity to do so. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like everybody else, my first thoughts and those of the Scottish Green Party are with those who've lost a loved one, those who are currently affected by the virus and those who are working to care for them across our health and social care services. But as well as wanting those people providing those services to be safe, people across Scotland are also concerned with the quality of care that their loved ones are getting. And as the First Minister is aware, one of the issues that's been raised with me and with other MSPs is the issuing of instructions not to resuscitate a patient in certain circumstances, known as DNR notices for short. Now, we are all conscious that in medical care, difficult decisions need to be made about the appropriate form of care for people if the worst does happen. But those decisions need to be taken in the context of respectful discussion with patients and their loved ones and in a way that respects dignity and control that people expect to have in these circumstances. Does the First Minister recognise that at the moment that isn't always happening in all circumstances and that some people have been concerned at the perception at least that DNR notices are being issued on a blanket basis and without the context of that respectful uh, mm. and, and calm discussion with uh, individual patients and their relatives where appropriate? First minister. Um, yes, I have, I have heard those concerns uh, from some people, um, and I do think uh, there, there are some cases of uh, professionals trying to do the right thing, but perhaps not in the best way. And there are discussions uh, that will be taken forward between uh, the, the medical professionals we have advising the government, like the chief medical officer, um, and in this case, GPs in particular. Uh, coronavirus aside, uh, we encourage uh, health professionals to talk to individuals and patients about anticipatory care, about what all of us as individual human beings would want or not want if we were in the final stages of our lives. And th these are important conversations. They should be held sensitively and properly. And they may ultimately uh, come to the point of asking somebody whether they would or would not want to be resuscitated um, if they got to that point. But let me be very clear. Nobody should receive a, a DNR uh, form out of the blue uh, without those sensitive discussions and absolutely nobody uh, should feel under any pressure to complete those and I, I want to be absolutely emphatically clear about that. We, we must continue to give people the best care that is available for them and the care that they would think is right for them. Sometimes that means respecting people's wishes about not wanting continued medical intervention but these uh, conversations must be sensitively held and always respect people's wishes. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful for that clarity. Can the First Minister give us an assurance uh, that care homes, for example, and those medical professionals working with them will be reminded of the, the complete need to continue to respect, as we normally do, the requirement for that long-term uh, and, and sensitive discussion with individuals? And can she give any advice to anyone out there who's concerned that their family member or loved one uh, has not been treated in the way that they should uh, in relation to these notices. First minister. Well, my, my, main, my main piece of advice would be nobody should feel under pressure to sign something of that nature that they do not feel comfortable signing or that they feel they haven't had the right advice and people uh, feel aggrieved that they've had letters like that, they can take that up through their health board and we will take steps to, to disseminate that uh, advice and information uh, more widely 
to GPs and, and care homes as well. There's one other uh, issue with care homes briefly because it's been suggested to me that uh, on almost on a blanket basis, if people in care homes uh, contract the virus, they will not be taken to hospital. And I want to be very clear, people should get the care that is right for them. And for anybody of any age, no matter where they're living, if that means being in hospital, that's where they should be. It will often be the case for an older person that the best and right place for them to be cared for is in their homely setting. Uh, but if they need to be in hospital, they should be in hospital because the NHS is there to provide the appropriate and best quality care for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Question number four, Willie Rennie. First Minister, I'll be out on my front doorstep this evening clapping for NHS workers, the social care workers, as well as other key workers as well. And I'm sure everybody else on this will be doing exactly the same. I also want to thank you for the work you're doing to keep us safe. We know you've got many challenges and I think I can speak for all of us that we're determined to help you overcome them. I'm concerned about the situation in care homes that you've just been talking about. Residents are vulnerable and the staff are essential. So we owe it to them all to get it right. Even though care homes are in lockdown, people are still being admitted. Some care homes are under considerable pressure to admit new residents from hospital without the necessary information to determine whether they are free from the virus. Ensure that the care homes get the information and support they need from the NHS to keep all of the residents safe. And secondly, if a care home resident catches the virus, the best place to treat them may still be in that home, but that should not mean that they are deprived of the right health care, just like everyone else. Does the NHS have the capacity and the capability for primary and secondary care to be delivered in the homes to give people the best chance of recovery? First and Minister. Well Thank, thank you for, for your comments at the outset and, and thank you for the question. Um, let me start at the end of that. Yes, the, the NHS um, is equipped to deal with this. The NHS is under incredible pressure and, and it will be increasing pressure, but we've been reorganising how the NHS works in order to ensure that it can deal with the coronavirus challenge. And that is about caring for and treating patients uh, when they need it and in the best way possible. Um, in terms of care homes, it is uh, appropriate for care homes uh, to admit uh, residents if that is appropriate and safe uh, to do. The care inspectorate is working closely with care homes to make sure they have the right uh, advice and the right support and any issues or concerns are flagged up and can be addressed. Uh, what matters most is of course the infection control measures that are in place in care homes. At a very early stage of uh, the epidemic guidance was sent to care homes about how they should be caring uh, for, for the residents. And unfortunately for a lot of residents in care homes right now, that is involving isolation in their own rooms and not having the, the communal activities that they will be used to. So this is really tough for them as well as for uh, the population generally. So we are, uh, we are looking to the care inspectorate to have an ongoing uh, supportive dialogue with care homes to help them manage through this crisis as well as they can. Willie Rennie. Yeah, thank you, First Minister. That's uh, very helpful and clear answers. Um, there are knock-on effects of this virus and the lockdown. On the one hand, people are finding new ways to connect to each other, helping each other in their community, and many are enthusiastically embracing their daily exercise. But I am concerned about the impact on people's mental health from isolation. And I'm concerned about the trauma that our health and social care workers are being exposed to. We just can't wait until all of this is over before we start to address those issues. So can we put in place mental health counselling for all NHS and social care staff right now? Is that possible? Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, on, a, on a lighter note, I'm prepared to predict that you're embracing your uh, physical exercise uh, responsibilities better than the rest of us are uh, right now. But it's a really important question because I've, from the outset of this, been acutely aware of the impact on people's mental health. Uh, the, just the stresses of living through a situation like this, the, the changes to people's lives, not being able to see people uh, that you're used to seeing, uh, family members, grandkids, grandparents, but also the additional burdens and challenges and stresses that are on our frontline health and care workers. So we are mindful of this right now. A couple of weeks ago, I think it was, we announced additional funding 
to expand, uh, for example, the NHS 24 uh, phone and online services that people can access. We gave additional funding to expand the breathing space service. Uh, so we're already trying to build up the capacity of the services that are already there. But I want to give an assurance that this is something that is very high on our priority list because not just uh, in the immediate phase of dealing with this, but I suspect for a long time afterwards, we're going to be dealing with a mental health legacy of it. And we need to make sure uh, that the services that provide the help that people need uh, are there. And that, yes, is about expanding access to counselling now, but looking ahead to making sure that these services are appropriate in the future as well. First Minister, can I say thank you very much indeed. In fact, can I say thank you to all our participants, all our party leaders this afternoon. Uh, we went slightly thank over you. time, uh, but this is a serious matter. It deserves serious consideration. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you everybody else for watching. That closes this session. Thank you. Thank you.